Can you? Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. Please go ahead. Okay. Please let me give me give me a cue when you want to change the slide. Okay. Uh, good morning to all. I am Vidya and uh, here I am uh, presenting some of the issues that we face during our uh, work with the uh, bamboo, uh, such, uh, especially on micropropagation and some of the solutions that we develop for them. And uh, then next slide, I think I can move. Okay. Then uh, being a bamboo community, there is no requirement of any introduction regarding this bamboo. But we have to wonder how this species is distributed throughout the world. It can be grow uh, in different climatic as well as soil conditions, and it is widely cultivated in different regions of the world for its timber, edible shoots, uh, its ornamental purpose, as well as for its environmental benefits. Next. Mm. Then uh, this being a large group of uh, plant community, it has uh, it exhibit great diversity, especially in terms of its size as well as its habitat. And here we can see the smallest one of the bamboo, uh, smallest one bamboo that is radiala vadisa, which is a very small, very small one, which uh, sized up a very few centimeter, which is named as radiala vanisa. And the second one is the dendrocolama sinicus, which is otherwise known as giant dragon bamboo, which is grows up to about four to six meter height with 37 centimeter of diameter. And this species is endemic to China, and uh, being uh, this uh, this group of uh, plant uh, community that is the bamboo she exhibit a great diversity its habitat habit also. That is some of the much shrub in nature that is Arundinaria kimona bamboosa etc. And some are reed like species that is our Oaklandra genus, and some are semi scandent straggler that is our Dinoclava species which is endemic to Andaman region that is Dinoclava andamanica. Etc. And the most common species of the bambusa, bambusa genus as well as the dendrocolama genus are come under the category of trees, the tree group. Next. And uh, there's a rhizome also. A rhizome is the underground stem, stem system of this particular uh, plant, plant group, which is uh, the which is the uh, uh, which is also can be classified mainly into two types that is pachymorph and leptomorph and again that we can again classify as pachymorph short naked as well as long naked. Our bambusa bambus are come under the group of short naked, whereas this long naked one is the oldina alpina, which is the an uh, important bamboo species of Ethiopia. And leptomorph uh, again we can classify that as short naked and long naked. Our Belocana baxifera come under the short naked category, whereas Philostachys groups are coming in the long naked group. Okay, so next. Next, okay, and the flowering uh, period, uh, flowering also uh, exhibited by this group is a very uh, interesting and it's a uh, flowering period is very unpredictable and some species exhibited about the uh, about 10 to 120 years, but there are some species shows annual flowering also like our Oaklanda studella and uh, some species exhibited gregarious type of flowering, others exhibited sporadic type of flowering and anyway, this phenomenon of flowering is very, uh, still it's an enigma to the uh, botanist uh, and we have to illustrate whether what is a uh, clear phenomenon it's controlling it okay next and uh, being all those uh, this diversity is existing there in the group of bamboo it is an essential part of the day-to-day -day life of human from the several community of the world uh, not only in tropical area but also in subtropical regions from the asian time itself this uh, bomb the in industrial application of this bamboo is widening because of its uh, because it is we can use it as a promising alternative for the conversion timber as is called or as engineer structure and it is a excellent feedstock for the pulp uh, pulp for paper or for viscose and for bioenergy also and uh, because of its carbon sequestration potential high carbon sequestration potential as well as the soil binding property it will become a, a best tool for the land restoration programs in many of the uh, locations in our world and uh, not only it's uh, not only all those things, it also uh, supplement for the food sustainability or food security. That is, it is uh, the, it's a tender shoot we can use as the edible shoots also. Okay, next. And uh, being uh, this uh, increased demand uh, never met by the uh, our uh, plantations or natural stands. So we have to develop the best plantations or uh, with the superior quality material and then we have to first we have, we have a lot of uh, diver, uh, 
we have a great diversity of bamboo species and we have to select the superior one from them and then we go for a large scale production of this plant uh, that particular superior variety through the propagation and the next one and these conventional method is that uh, we used for this propagation is the seeds as well as vegetative propagation we already tell, uh, told about that this uh, bamboo flowering is an unpredictable uh, have a nature of unpredictable and as well as low flowering cycles and being a species it's undergone the flowering and it produces a huge number of uh, seeds but it has a very short viable period and the seedlings, uh, the propagules produced from this, uh, from the germinator seeds, it shows a like, very uh, genetic diversity among this. And we know that there are some of the economically important bamboo species, such as Bambusa balkava, Dendrochlamus toxi, etc., are sterile species too. They don't have any seed sitting at all. So then the next one method is that the vegetative propagation. Here we have come cutting rhizome offsets, branch cutting, air layering, etc. But this procedure has a lot of uh, restrictions, such as it produces very low, it has a very low multiplication rate, limited availability of the propagules, and the propagules that we made from this methods are very huge in size, and it is limited the transportation of this material. Here, the micro propagation stand is uh, its own way, and it gives the uh, it can produce uh, huge numbers of uh, uh, propagules within a limited time. Okay, next. Next slide. Okay. Then micropropagation, we adopt two methods, that is accidental proliferation and somatic embryonesis. That are the common uh, uh, adopted method for this bamboo micropropagation. And the advantages of this micropropagation is that it can produce a uniform plants uh, with, uh, which reduce the elimination of the inherent uh, genetic variation that raised in the seed population, as well as it can produce the pest and disease free plants. And uh, from uh, according to Gillis in 2011, 2001, a successful micropropagation can produce about 0.5 million plants from a single X plant. And there are a lot of protocols are available for bamboo species, uh, around 54 species. We can produce, uh, we, uh, we have the record for this uh, uh, successful micropropagation method. Okay, next one. Okay, uh, this. But uh, um, uh, I told you about the uh, protocols that are available for the 54 species, but there are still uh, lots of constraints are uh, existing for uh, development of successful micropropagation mother. That is the, the major uh, restrictions are the insufficient micropropagation rate, tissue brownie, microbial contamination. Besides, we have hyperhidrosity, low in vitro routine response, reduced survival during hardening and acclimatization, as well as the in vitro flowering which lead to the uh, death of the culture. Okay, next one. And uh, this uh, these are the constraints, constraints which uh, reduce the wider application or uh, it's reduce the potential of the in vitro propagation, of, especially in adult species. So here in this talk, we, we are focusing on the uh, some of, comparison of the two, uh, two species. Uh, one is calcitrant and the other one is easy species to propagate. And the, some other issues that uh, we found during the multiplication of that particular species and the incidence of latent contaminations and some uh, protocol that we developed to restore the, uh, control this uh, incident of this latent contamination as well as the uh, in vitro flowering. Okay, next slide. Sir. And here we compare uh, two species. The first one is pseudoxygen and gastroxy, and other one is the pseudoxygen darichi. In, we all know that this pseudocytosis toxi is a, uh, economically very important species and there are a lot of protocols are available from IWST, the, especially Dr. Rathor, he made an excellent protocol for the, the species. And uh, there is the, the other species that is pseudocytosis richi, which is also, the this species also show the same, most of the same characteristics of this uh, uh, Stoxy and uh, this species also endemic to Western Ghats and this is uh, this Richie is also true uh, true solid species with a uh, very uh, uh, more hardened than this uh, Stoxy. So we try to establish a protocol for this species, but we found that uh, this is uh, a bit of recalcitrant in many aspects. First one is that it couldn't give a better uh, sprouting response also. And uh, when we are inoculating the stoxy, uh, within the three, uh, four to five days, we will get a better sprouting response with uh, five to six uh, initial buds. But uh, this uh, rich gives a very less amount of uh, sprouting rate. So next one. 
and then uh, uh, we uh, go on to the multiplication rate uh, uh, going to the multiplication rate and this uh, this species this particular species that is pseudocinda richi shows uh, very uh, difficult to respond to in most of the experiment and the main one is that's the tissue browning here you can see the photograph of the richi which shows the uh, brown tissue browning in culture here where the stoxy shows the uh, very good multiplication rate and here we resolve this problem by adjusting the ph of the media and uh, the most of the tissue culture media we adopt the ph is 5.6 but this ph is not suitable for this uh, our particular this pseudoxinella ricci so here we adjust the ph we tried many other um, any other chemicals and all those things but just simply adjusting the ph of the media to the acidic level that is at ph 4.5 we got a better multiplication as well as we eradicate the tissue browning problem also then next slide sir and uh, here the we end, uh, enhance the multiplication rate of this uh, richie using this uh, a, a relatively new uh, b uh, cytokine that is metatoporin and uh, we tried uh, we were tried many of the uh, uh, cytokines and the combinations of cytokine with toxins for inducing the enhancing the multiplication rate of this uh, richie but uh, in, uh, in most of the experiments it gives very uh, there is no significant hike in the multiplication rate so then we came to the this uh, new meta, uh, new cytokine that is metatoporin and here we found a very better result with the species but uh, when we went to the rooting experiments, this toxic gave, we, we, this gave a hundred percent result with the root induction uh, protocols. But that time the Rishi this never responded for or it, it shows us some indications of root induction or something, something, but it won't go for the next step. Next step. And uh, then we tried with somatic embryosis, and for those also we done uh, we were carried out a lot of experiments in the in all steps and uh, for the callus initiation we tried uh, different types of explants different types of plant growth regulators different basal nutrient media also and for explant type we used sleeve sheets uh, leaf sheet leaf segments uh, and inter nodes and nodal segments from the axillary sprouted axillary but sprouts and here we got a very good combat uh, and nodular callus for the leaf sheet for stoxy but for richie we uh, saw and fibrous callus is obtained from most of the explants that we selected. And uh, it is found that for the uh, monocots, especially in, uh, in uh, um, bamboo, and this fibrous uh, callus is non embryogenic too. Next. And uh, these are the effect of the plant growth relatives that we tried and uh, different basal nodia basal uh, nutrient media that we tried for inducing this uh, uh, root uh, callus induction and uh, here we are, why we tried for the different basal media is that some of the species some of the plant group is or some plant species itself works with different uh, different uh, basal nutrients for example maize always gives better response in uh, b5 media likewise sugarcane is works with wpm and tea cures also respond uh, very good with wpm so we are we we have to check what is the hindrance of this particular species that is richie to induce some so my embryogenic color so for that we tried different basal media but there also we didn't give any better result and especially in uh, and a very very bit of positive result we uh, uh, obtained from the wpm with the 24d and kinetin okay next sir and uh, then uh, we got uh, this uh, from the obtained callus uh, for the richie we got this uh, fibrous callus but in, for this toxic we got the combat callus and then we done some multiplication ex uh, experiments on this uh, here also we uh, 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 tried different auxins as well as basal nudi and the, uh, uh, different concentrations of uh, sucrose also but in most of the experiments the bond formation of the callus in richie uh, it's gray, uh, varied greatly and uh, this callus uh, and in most combination this uh, the callus of the richie can black to brown and it will get into uh, dyed uh, over a period of time and uh, this and this uh, callus multiplication stage also there is no signal for the uh, embryogenesis in richie and uh, but for the 
stokes see the uh, we uh, in the experiment we found that this 1.5 percent is usually for uh, callous induction under most of the treatment with uh, micro propagation and uh, we are using three percentage of sucrose as the standard but here we found that this 1.5 percent of sucrose in the multiplication media induce uh, it reduced the problem of mucilaginous uh, there is a bit of uh, mucilaginous uh, type of callus it is reduced from the depends upon the uh, expand what we are developed and in some species that is uh, embryogenic but some are uh, some in stoxy it is non embryogenic so we have to eradicate we re remove that mucilaginous by using this uh, uh, using this across as uh, this is a concentration of 7.5 percentage okay next slide and uh, this are and for uh, just after multiply this uh, um, callus this we go for the embryo induction maturation and germination here also we try different kinds of plant growth laboratories and for stroke c we got better response with the uh, iba and bap combination it's uh, induced about 71.63 percentage of somatic embryos whereas na and bap give 64.28 percentage but uh, this uh, in richie there is no uh, signal for this uh, no sign for any embryogenesis and uh, this um, so uh, this in we shifted that embryo uh, induction we shifted that uh, embryos into the vap uh, ms media with vap alone here in that is at a 2.2 micromolar and it gives a very better germination response also so next slide sir and uh, this uh, hardened plants uh, uh, just after uh, in, uh, along uh, get germinating we transfer this plant material for the hardening and here uh, we kept in uh, mist house uh, for four weeks and then shifted to the uh, open nursery with a uh, ratio of sand and soil in one is to one uh, one is to one ratio and this we found that the new shoots and uh, uh, new leaves and root will uh, found within three days three weeks of this hardening in the mist chamber itself and uh, it was found that uh, we can we were produce about uh, more than 2000 plants from the somatic embryonesis process as well as uh, 500 plants from the alcohol proliferation stoxy but in the case the rich stoxy uh, sorry in richie there is plant regeneration was very less but uh, in meantime we got a uh, flowering of uh, one of the clump that we, uh, that we raised in our uh, KFRA bamboos, uh, KFRA uh, main uh, campus, and uh, this we collected some seeds from that Richie and the immature seeds we gave a bit of uh, embryogenesis, and from that itself we got only 18.9 percentage of uh, uh, callus for uh, and this uh, that will show a, a bit of uh, regeneration. Okay, next slide, sir. And these are the photographs of the uh, regeneration in different stages. And uh, the, uh, the, the last one is the uh, uh, embryogenesis and uh, regenerated plants of Richie, but it wouldn't grow up. And uh, these are the uh, uh, photograph of the one year old uh, stoxy that uh, raised from uh, somatic embryonesis, which grows in field. Okay, next slide. And then coming to the next major constraint is that the microbial contamination and the incidence of contamination is very high uh, during the monsoon period followed by winter and summer. Monsoon, we got about 68.19 percentage of uh, um, contamination where it is reduced to 6.02 at summer. And uh, this, uh, uh, the, this is because of the very uh, complex structure of this uh, bamboo. This actually but itself has a very lots of leaf sheets and all things and it's a intercellular vessels and cavities called the lots of microbes there. And uh, we evaluated these micro, uh, microbes uh, throughout the year and we found that uh, there is 73 contaminating bacteria microbes from different bamboo species and uh, among these 11 were found to be frequently appearing during the uh, most of the bamboo species irrespective of the uh, uh, season and among this 11 we have six bacteria and fungi five fungi were identified and bacillus subtilis and bucerium oxysforium were found to be the major role uh, which played a major role 
throughout the year, irrespective of the bamboo species. And uh, this are, these are found, to, found as the endophytic to the uh, uh, particular bamboo species. But this endophytic population depends on the various factors such as uh, host, climatic factors, geographical regions, etc. And the selected clumps of the mother plants, which grows in the same location, also exhibit a great variation in their endophytic populations. But some endophytic populations and endophytes exhibit a great host range in types of and related plants too. But uh, this support is uh, uh, support, uh, micropropagation. Commonly, we are adopting the treatment for, with the mercury chloride, that is of 0.1% of mercury chloride for eight minutes, which give the control of most of the exogenous microbial contamination. Next, sir. And uh, this is a list of the endophytes that we isolated from the different, three different bamboo species, that is Balkova, Stoxy, and Ricci. And from this list, we can uh, find out that uh, the presence of Fusarium oxys for a manifestory uh, basal surplus throughout the year and irrespective of the season. Okay, next. And uh, this, uh, we to I told about the uh, treatment with mercury chloride, but we found that it is ineffective against endophytic bacteria and fungi, which cause the latent contamination in culture. And this eradication of this endophyte can be achieved through the antibody treatment or uh, antibody treatment. But from our study, we found out that the elimination of the endophytes from the uh, shoot cultures cause a uh, adverse effect on the uh, survival of the shoot culture. For that, we uh, the, in our one of our study uh, with the uh, Nandoclamus lodges pathos, we raised some uh, shoot cultures from the seeds. And from the third culture on base, we found that the media were got turbid, and uh, but the shoots are grown very well. And uh, why it's happened? So we evaluated the culture, uh, we evaluated the media, and we found that there is a presence of the particular bacteria that is porosus in a pasture. And uh, we used uh, the antibiotics that is gentamicin to remove the uh, bacteria from the culture. But after the treatment, we found that the refresh rate of this uh, culture is reduced to 0 0.089. And uh, but whereas in the uh, culture with bacteria, it's found that uh, about 3.17 gram per uh, 1 gram for the uh, fresh weight. But uh, as for, from this, we found out, uh, we identified that the presence of this bacteria caused some a bit of uh, support into the shoot culture. So we done two types of experiments. First, we co-cultured the uh, shoot culture with the isolate system. Uh, in for that, we inoculate the pure culture of this porous as in a pasture into the shoot cultures of the nodoclans, longest pathos. And we cultured this bacteria into the LB broth and we extract the uh, uh, broth, uh, extract the Filtrate, uh, filtrate from the broth and add to the fresh media of the shoot cultures. And from the both experiment, we found that, that the, uh, when we inoculated the uh, bacteria into the uh, shoot cultures, the uh, uh, biomass enhanced to a uh, significant level. That is, it reached to 2.716 gram in the first subculture itself, uh, in the end of the first subculture. But the addition of this pen media uh, played also a very good uh, uh, role, and it, uh, it raised the fresh ma mass biomass to 9.35 gram from 0 0.089. Next slide, sir. So we decided to do some uh, uh, some analysis on this particular bacteria, whether it have any uh, role on growth promotion or things. Uh, so from this, uh, from different studies, we found out that it has a property of producing auxins. That is, uh, and uh, here we can see the uh, uh, um, uh, pictures of this uh, 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 oxygen analysis, IA analysis, that is using Salkovsky reagent reactions. And uh, here, this pink color exhibited the pro uh, production of the oxygens and, and uh, the graph, we done some photometric analysis uh, for uh, evaluate the product efficiency of this uh, bacteria, how much it is producing these auxins. And uh, the experiment one, that is we inoculated the uh, bacteria in LB broth with uh, LB broth. And it is found that about 11.26 microgram per ml of IAA produced. Whereas when it is this bacteria grown along with the shoot culture, we found that it's, it's produced about 98.6 microgram of auxins per ml. And uh, this, uh, we found another important uh, factor is that when this bacteria is along with the shoot culture, there is no any other bacteria 
infected your fungi into that culture. So again, we interest to analyze the uh, uh, antimicrobial property or antagonistic property of this particular species. And it is found that it can it has the capacity to produce the CIDRA4 as well as it also inhibit uh, it also inhibit the growth of the other uh, bacteria and fungi using this antagonistic property. And the second uh, second uh, uh, picture you can see in the first picture you can see the uh, capacity of this bacteria to produce the CIDRA4. And the second slide you can see the uh, prevention of this fusarium oxysporium uh, by this forest as in a pastory. Okay, so next slide, sir. And we, uh, from this study, we understand this the uh, complete elimination of this endophytes bacteria is not desirable. So we selected three bamboo species that is Toxia richi and Bambusa balcova, and we start we evaluate we uh, illustrated certain protocol for controlling the latent contamination using some uh, eco friendly mothers uh, and for that we selected some chemicals which are uh, which is come under the category of gras that is genetically recognized as safe and uh, the most of these chemicals are uh, uh, that commonly used in our day-to-day -day life of uh, as the preservatives in food cosmetics and pharmaceuticals and also we selected uh, we activated the plant defense mechanisms we uh, the plants also have some uh, mechanism of uh, defense the invading of this microorganisms from its uh, disease so, so we activated that also next slide sir and uh, for the, in the coming to the uh, preservatives, we selected the organic acids, acids as well as their salts. And the lactic acid, uh, citric acid, acidic acid, etc., are some of them. And here we found the effectiveness of the lactic acids. And uh, 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 it is very effective at the concentration of 0.5 percentage. It reduced the uh, latent con uh, initial contamination to uh, 0 0.79 to 1.6, 1.5 percentage in the bond zone season, where it is, whereas in the control it is found as 68 percentage of contamination but it uh, this concentration has some adverse effect on the scout and response so we have to adjust it so we adjust the uh condom ray concentration of this um, um lactic acid to a reduced level about the 0.1 percentage and it is found to be very suitable for most of the bamboo species but uh this uh, uh here Again, the effect of the pH has very a great role on the controlling this contamination using this static acid. And the, at pH 5.5, it reduced the contamination up to 3.5 to 3.9. But at we reduced the pH to 3 uh, pH 3. Uh, and here also a, uh, a significant level of reduction that is about a 3.1 to 3.69 percent of uh, uh, percentage of contamination is obtained in the initial stage. And but this pH, pH is very host specific because we already know that for Richie we adopted a pH of 4.5. Okay, next. And uh, this is a uh, uh, different treatment with uh, bamboo, uh, different three different bamboo species. In the case of lactic acid, uh, in uh, the, we use different uh, pH that is three, 4.5, 5.6, and six with the different concentrations. Okay, next. And uh, then similarly, acetic acid also uh, tried for the uh, inhibiting the contaminations. But here, uh, this uh, effective concentration of this um, uh, lactic acid is 0.2 percentage. But uh, it, this uh, this adversely affect the or delaying the but breaking the response of the uh, species. It's delayed up to 10 days. And where it in, in uh, lactic acid, we will get a bit, uh, better sprouting rate by fourth day of inoculation. But it, in as when we are using acetic acid, it's delayed up to 10 days of inoculation. Okay, next slide. And this is a result of this uh, treatment of acetic acid with different bumper species. Okay, next. next. And uh, this is citric acid. Uh, we know this uh, citric acid is uh, one of the naturally uh, obtaining organic acids. And uh, here also uh, give a very better effect, uh, better uh, contamination control at the pH 4.5. And at the percentage of the 0 0.02 percentage is required for the controlling the exogenous as well as endogenous contaminations. Okay, next. Okay, next. Oh, no, I think this is and this is a result of this uh, pH, uh, the effect of this citric acid in different bamboo species. And here we can find that the uh, enhancing the pH, that is, uh, we, when we are making up the pH into the standard level, that is up to 5.6 or 6, the effectiveness of citric acid is reducing. Oh, okay. And uh, this, uh, this uh, it's not influencing any, any kind of uh, exogenous as well as endophytic contamination at the higher pH level. Okay, next slide. 
And similarly, the other organic salts such as calcium propionate, potassium sorbate, as on, are also used for the control of these contaminations. And uh, here we are recommending calcium propionate uh, because it, it could, could reduce the latent contaminations at very effective level. And uh, that is, uh, we can use the very low concentration that is about 0.02 percentage. And uh, it, uh, it delayed the uh, expression of this uh, latent contamination after the 80 or 90 days of culture. And potassium sorbate is uh, also uh, very good for the uh, 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 exogenous contamination, but it has uh, um, it has uh, uh, a it it, it required the uh, for better performance. It required the pH range of uh, three to four point five. Okay, next. Uh, this is some photographs of the uh, graphs and uh, tables showing the effect of uh, calcium propionate and the slicer. And uh, this is the uh, potassium effect of potassium sorbate. Okay, next. So here we again use benzoic acid and or sodium benzoate and sodium metabisulfate. But uh, here this uh, sodium metabisulfate is not recommended because it's a uh, continuous exposure uh, reduced the um, uh, result in the reduced multiplication of the shoots as well as biomass. And uh, but in the case of sodium benzoate or benzoic acid, it is found to be very be better for the uh, um, controlling the contamination in all stages. And it also have uh, some sort of uh, growth promoter properties too. Okay, next. Uh, okay, just skip this. Too. Okay, then coming to the other param other uh, chemicals that we are selected for this controlling are the uh, preservatives that we are commonly used in pharmaceuticals and cosmetics. That is the methyl paraben. And uh, here we found that the 0 0.03 percentage of methyl paraben is very effective uh, for uh, effective and uh, where it is <clears throat> Uh, where and uh, it can be used as an alternative for mercury chloride too. And uh, this uh, it's also resulted in the, uh, this, uh, we can use this in a different way. First, we can uh, use the asana, uh, same as the mercury chloride treatment, or we can add this to the media itself. And the addition of this media and this, uh, the chemicals uh, that is following, that is uh, uh, three chemicals we used for this, uh, from, we selected from this categories, that is methyl paraben, uh, benzyl chloride, chloride and uh, thimerosal. And this uh, thimerosal and methyl paraben can be, uh, can be used as an additive in the media and we can reuse the media for the next stages also. Okay, next slide. Okay, this is the effect of the middle paraben. Next one. Next one, sir. And uh, this is a thimerosal slide and uh, here we can found the effective concentration of this thimerosal is 0 0.02 percentage and <clears throat> But the, uh, the uh, drawback of this thimerosal is that this is an also a mercury containing uh, chemical and but uh, compound and uh, it uh, the uh, long exposure of this thimerosal adversely affect the uh, sprout and response as well as the multiplication rate. So we have to uh, remove, we have to uh, keep a periodical exposure only to this uh, thimerosal containing media or we can use it as an uh, alternative for mercury chloride. As a, surface, as a surface realization agent. Okay, next slide, sir. Um, this is, okay. Okay, this I already mentioned about it. Okay, you can go for the next slide. Yeah, here I told that is continuous expression of this exposed uh, uh, to the thimer salt media reduces pyrotin rate. So there is, uh, but there is no effect of this thimerosal on latent contamination. So this application of this thimerosal is only restricted to the surface surface uh, sterilization protocol. Okay, next. This is the benzyl chlorine chloride. And here we found that this, this chemical is also used in the different uh, pharmaceutical companies and uh, cosmetics as the preservatives. And here, this is a cationic detergent and uh, this, uh, this uh, how, how the capacity to control the contamination in nodal explants and same as after the as the our mercury chloride but it, it don't have any adverse effect on this uh, um, adverse effect on this protein rate and all things but the uh, if here uh, we use this uh, as this uh, this uh, benzyl chloride alone have any 
withdrawal but so we can uh, use it as a second sur uh, surface sterilization agent just after mercury chloride we uh, for the mercury chloride treatment material we got about 68.9 percent of contamination in one zone but if you are using this uh, benzyl chlorine chloride just after mercury chloride that we are giving a one more uh, surface sterilization procedure it reduces the contamination to a very significant level okay next next one okay and then the last, uh, second aspects of the controlling this contamination is that the activation of the plant defense system. And uh, already we already know that the plant have a very uh, very good uh, um, defense mechanism or immunity power to control the uh, kind of uh, infection from the uh, from the biotic as well as abiotic stresses. And uh, from we are just elicitating this uh, this. Uh, uh, activity of this um, uh, plant material uh, using some um, uh, uh, bi biotic as well as abiotic materials. And for, through this elicitation activities, we found that uh, there are lots of uh, um, changes uh, exhibited in within the plant material. That is, it induced the membrane depolarization, it produced it indu induce the production of the active, uh, re reactive oxygen compounds, it uh, uh, enhanced the production of phytoalexin plant pathogen related proteins proteinase inhibitors lignin synthesis and callus formation also happen when if uh, after this elicitation and all these situation pathways are happened through the some of the product, uh, enhanced production of the some of the phytohormones such as jasmonic acid ethylene and salicylic acid and here we activated the primary uh, activated the uh, this response of this uh, plant system using this uh, elicitors and uh, this and we explore this way to control the contaminations in tissue culture in latent stages. Next slide, sir. And uh, chitosan is the one of the best, uh, best uh, um, uh, first mother uh, uh, chemical used for this treatment. And here we uh, for chitosan. Uh, then uh, exopolysaccharide and uh, the, the these two are common the biotic elicitase. For the abiotic elicitase, we sell, selected beta aminobutyric acid as well as hydrogen peroxide. And this uh, for all those treatment, we selected. Uh, we uh, excuse me one second. Just a minute. Um, sorry for the interruption. I uh, I had an uncertainty. So, okay. Uh, then uh, for the prophylactic treatment, uh, we we done two uh, different kinds of treatment with the material. First, we treated the mother plant. That is, we done some prophylactic treatment just before the twenty four hours of the collection uh, of the explants, and uh, then uh, then we uh, treated the plant material itself. And in some cases, we amend the, these chemicals with the tissue culture media. For this uh, treatment, uh, prophylactic treatment, we found that this incident of contamination is reduced to very uh, to about uh, uh, 0.05 percentage at a concentration of 1.05 percentage. So next slide. And uh, when uh, we use this chitosan in amend uh, with the media. And we found that this has a very great effect on the contamination reduction. That is, it's reduced it to 98 percentage. But this long exposure of this media of this uh, uh, material to the uh, chitosan, it reduced the uh, uh, sprouting response as well as it deteriorated the plant material. So we done an experiment to evaluate the exposure time, and it is found that in 48 hours of exposure to the uh, chitosan containing media, it uh, it gave a better response in all uh, uh, aspects that we are looking. That is, it enhanced the sprouting rate as well as reduced the contamination rate in in a very uh, great way. That is, it reduced to about 0.083 percentage. Okay, next. Then uh, we uh, tried with exopolysaccharide. I already told you that the bacillus subtilis, which is one of the most important bacteria, which found throughout the, uh, throughout the uh, year in most of the species as the contaminating end of fight. And we ex uh, uh, extracted exopolysaccharide from bacillus subtilis, and we used that particular uh, exopolysaccharide for the prophylactic treatment. And here we found that about four milligram per ml 
is the effective concentration of this uh, 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 effective concentration of this exopolysaccharide for treatment with the this uh, plants in uh, field conditions and it reduced the endogenous uh, contamination to a level of three uh, percentage. Then uh, for hydrogen peroxide, uh, this gives a, we tried a diff, uh, wide uh, range of concentration and it is found that we, if we are using uh, one millimolar hydrogen peroxide as well as 10 millimolar hydrogen peroxide, both have uh, in all seconds we got a very uh, similar result. Uh, very uh, the same result only obtained through the throughout of this much of uh, gap, this much of wide range of concentrations, and it is found that it reduces the. Um, but uh, this uh, the uh, this effect is that we are using higher concentration of hydrogen peroxide, it reduces the uh, but breaking spout uh, frequency to a less than sixty eight percentage. So also we used to treat the. Um, uh, uh, hydrogen peroxide only for this um, uh, prophylactic treatment. Okay, next one. Okay, next one. And uh, then, uh, so we, uh, we before, uh, without adding to the media, we treated the branch cuttings. Uh, when we are going for the feed and for collecting the explant, we are just taking the secondary branches of the bamboo as the uh, uh, make, uh, bamboo for the culture initiation and the uh, actually buds from the secondary branches we are using. So the, when we collected the material from the free, we are taking it as a length of uh, one, uh, 45 centimeter to 1.5 meter. And uh, we, the, we collected that material and just trim it into uh, a precise size of about a 45 centimeter. And then we give some treatment with that uh, material uh, this, and uh, with that uh, treatment, uh, we found that this uh, contamination is reduced to 1.97 percentage. And uh, this, um, and but the uh, only adverse effect is that the uh, sprouting response, but breaking rate is reduced to, and it is um, delayed up to a seven, seven days. Okay, next one. And another chemical that we used for the uh, treatment is vitamin and butyric acid. And here also we done the both uh, both way of experiments. That is, we added in the uh, uh, added in the media as well as we treated the mother plant. And uh, the optimum concentration for the treatment is two, uh, 200 microgram per ml. And whether it is reduced the contamination to a six percentage, and uh, it is uh, this is particularly working on the uh, fungal contamination. Is uh, but I have been, uh, uh, this six percentage is mainly uh, restricted to the bacterial contamination. There is no uh, uh, presence of any uh, fungal contamination in any most of the stages. And uh, but the uh, media amendment we use the reduced concentration of 30 microgram per ml, and it uh, it totally reduced the latent contamination up, up to 80 to 90 days of culture. And in the initial stage, it reduced the contamination to a level of one percentage. Okay, next one. And from the, uh, this, all those experiments, we found that this uh, this addition of this organic acids or their co uh, their salts reduced the contaminations to a very uh, in a, in a microbial uh, biostatic methods, and it's in enhanced uh, shoot growth also. And the activation of the uh, plant defense system induced the antimicrobial response within the plant system, and it uh, some most of these chemicals have uh, direct antimicrobial actions also. So it has the capacity to do, uh, reduce the exogenous contamination also. Besides the uh, suppressing on the end of it. Okay, next one. This, uh, this, this is in vitro flowering is another one of the major constraints in the uh, bamboo tissue culture. Uh, and uh, this uh, this uh, reduced the uh, multiplication, uh, multiplication, the efficient micropropagation as well as it's led to the death of the shoot culture also. Even though it's a uh, bad, bad thing into the in, uh, micropropagation, it's a good model to facilitate the understanding of the physiology of the flowering. Usually this uh, uh, flowering is happened in this uh, culture media through the uh, different interactions such as exogenous as well as endogenous phytohormones, different levels of sugars, and the presence of some minerals as well as the phenols that are extracted from the plant material. And uh, so, this uh, for uh, for eradicating this condition from the uh, micropropagation, for uh, we are just mainly uh, just aiming for large scale production of shoot cultures. We always keep the fresh media to subculture in a very short period of time as with the lower cytokine concentration with a shorter light period. That is the uh, method, uh, way to avoid the in vitro flowering in the 
uh, micro publication on shoe cultures. So, but uh, uh, being a good model, we try to standardize uh, uh, a good system of uh, a flower induction in bamboo because we can utilize this system for study the biochemical, molecular, as well as physiological stems, and which will which may lead to the light into the uh, flowering cycles as well as flowering properties of our bamboo. So, for, for that, we use uh, different uh, physical as well as chemical parameters. You know, physical parameters we use uh, for the period, different stress factors such as water stress, mineral depletion, long culture period, low salt media. And for uh, plant uh, chemicals, uh, we use plant growth relatives such as cytokinin and auxins, different carbohydrate sources, and as well as different sucrose level. So, next slide. And for photo period, we adopted uh, five different uh, photo cycles. So that is 6 to 18, 4 to, uh, 10 to 14, 12 to 12, 14 to 10, and 8 to 16. And uh, this stress factors for inducing the water stress, we use the different concentration of agar, that is 8, 9, and 10 percentage, peg and uh, monitor. And for mineral depression, we occurred through the sub extending the subculturing period of uh, about four to eight weeks of time. And local salt, con salt concentration we obtained through the diluted uh, MS vessel media, that is one by 10 dilution, one by 100 dilution, and one by 1000 dilutions of MS vessel media used for the flower induction. For the cytokinin, we use BAP at different concentrations and the TDSA, that, uh, TDSA also we use. And uh, auxins with the uh, IBA 525 and 10, uh, 50 micromolar and NA at 525 and 50 micromolar. Different carbohydrate sources such as sucrose, fructose, glucose, uh, lactose, and maltose are three percentage we added into the media for inducing the flower cycle, a uh, flowering in, in vitro conditions. And uh, different sucrose, sucrose itself we tried in different concentration that is three percentage, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. 9 and 10 percentage. For all those experiments, we use the liquid media of MS with BAP 50 micromolar with sucrose 3 percentage. For particular conditions, we change the concentration of BAP as well as sucrose. So, next slide. And uh, the, from the uh, experiments that conducted for photo period, we found that the, uh, there is a positive correlation for the flowering in, uh, in vitro. Uh, in vitro condition and here is there is no floral but development in the low flow, uh, daylight time that is 8 to 16 and 10 to 14 there is no flower uh, flower development happen but the shoot cultures that incubated at 12 to 12 1 14 to 4, 10 showed a shortening of the new shoe or new uh, that uh, there is a very uh, uh, interesting phenomena happened that is it reduced the length of the shoe cultures it it's uh, uh, into uh, induced the shoe cultures into the cluster like formation, very small clusters formation. And uh, but the flora spikes numbers was significantly increased in the five bamboo species that we tried for uh, for the induction at a photo period of six to 16 to 18 hour photo period. And in, uh, in that case, we got flowering within the 48 day of uh, sorry, 52 days of induction. For bamboo satolda, we got the flowering by 40 days, and for bamboo balkova, we got by 42 days and Newton's it is 46 days, Stokes is 48 days. But for Dendroflamus noises for us, it took about 52 days for induction because it's a it is a this true culture is developed from a lot of seeds, but others are developed from the mature plants, mature uh, plants. Okay, and as rebirth from the mature plants. Okay, then uh, but for uh, this uh, for the in the same case that we obtained for the 10 14 to 10 hour quarter period here it is delayed up to after 40 days of inoculation that is in uh, bulk of it we obtained by 71 days and told us 74 days Newton's is 82 days uh, and uh, dendrochromus donis it uh, took around 90 day 95 days and so is 75 days and uh, this when we are keeping the long duration of uh, darkness, uh, this is natively affect the um, uh, shoot cultures. But that is uh, this uh, it's uh, induce some mutilation. It's reduce it uh, induce the, the defoliating of this uh, uh, leaf. But it's never affect the normal growth of the shoot culture. Okay, next. And then this coming to the water stress, it, we found that the flowering frequency of the agar. 
uh, is very less at a different photo period. That is, it is ranging from 0.09% to 3.60 percentage. And here also the great influence of the photo period on this uh, flowering uh, cycle in this uh, water stress condition also. We got a 60, uh, we got uh, 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 flowering at 10% of pig in Bambus and Newtons and uh, Balkova within 16, uh, within 32 days. And uh, here it is found that uh, this flowering was induced by 16 to 8 hour of photo period. And uh, this uh, in water stress, the most of the uh, uh, this uh, the whatever the material which shows the flowering induction, uh, which is occurred within the six days of inoculation, but it also induce this water stress greatly damage the tissue material and it induces shoot necrosis also. And uh, this uh, the chemicals that is at a concentration of five percent of pig as well as the eight percent of agar, it uh, never affect any shoot proliferation of this material. Okay, next one. This is a result of this uh, uh, water stress induced flowering in different bamboo species. Next, Next uh, and uh, mineral depression <clears throat> through the long duration of culture period. Here we found that when we are uh, inoculating this culture for a four week of time, we uh, there is a, a depression of nutrients occur at the end of this culture period, but suddenly we are shifting that culture into a fresh media that time the stress induced by this uh, depression at the end of this uh, for fourth week is easily recovered by the fresh media nutrients so there is no flowering in the uh, fourth period uh, for the subculture period of four weeks but when we are starting uh, uh, looking into the fourth week passages we have found that the flowering induction was ha happened flowering uh, induction was happened by the um, uh, third passages, but the uh, the complete transition into the flowers is occurred after one to one twenty six days of inoculation. And but in the case of eight week of passage, this uh, flowering is flowering itself happened within the third passages. That is within the one ten days of inoculation. And with this happened because this the much of long duration, the complete transition of the floral meristem into the sorry uh, vegetative meristem into the floral meristem happened within the first period of inoculation itself. And uh, then we are then we are shift, after shifting that uh, in induced culture into the second uh, media, there is the, that nutrients just supporting the uh, full development of this floral meristem into the uh, in the final stages. That's why the, we will get a better result in the eight week passage. This, this much of uh, this passage that is eight week culture period. Okay, next slide. And uh, the, when we are using the low salt basal media, this uh, the, this we found that uh, the most of this uh, uh, low salt media has a effect with the uh, effect on flower induction, except on the uh, ten to fourteen hours of period, for the period, and uh, the. In the dilution with one by thousand, uh, thousand, it enhanced the rooting. Uh, sorry, enhanced the flowering within four weeks of inoculation. And this, uh, this uh, nutrient stress generally in uh, bud induction of the uh, most of the species into flower, floral medicine. So we we found that this uh, association of the for better result for uh, inducing the flowering uh, within a short period, we have to adopt the, this uh, one by thousand dilution of the MS media with for the period of 16, uh, 16, eight is the better tool for inducing this uh, flower induction. Okay, next one. And uh, this, uh, this dilution, uh, they, I already told you that this, the uh, dilution is greatly influenced the biomass of the uh, biomass leaf area and length of the flowering also. This uh, flowers are found to be very, very small uh, compared to the other, uh, the other flowers obtained from the other, uh, from the other treatment. So uh, there is no uh, shoots there also. Uh, most of the, uh, most of the shoots uh, uh, induced from this. Uh, from this treatment, there were the flower buds. Okay, next one. And cytokinin coming, uh, cytokinin is this uh, uh, 15 micromolar BAP itself uh, induced flowering by seven, uh, 70th day of inoculation and uh, 90, whereas 90 micromolar BAP gives within uh, 30 days of inoculation, but this also associated with the photo period of six to eight, six to eight. 
and the TDS is also induced flowering at the uh, micro, uh, concentration of 55 micromolar at the second pass radius. And but uh, the treatment uh, uh, shows that the uh, this high uh, high concentrations of cytokine is adversely affect the normal growth of the plant material. It uh, uh, abnormally reduces the length of this plant uh, uh, elongated shoots into the very small one. And the newly formed buds are always uh, uh, tend to be a floral buds. Okay, next one. This is a result of the flower induction by cytokine. Okay, next. And uh, we uh, again we tried with some of the auxins for flower induction, and uh, some studies by uh, studies shown that the auxins also have great role on the flower induction. So we tried IBA and NAA, and uh, IBA at four point nine micromolar uh, induced only rooting. There is no reproductive growth is found there, and whereas uh, NA uh, NA at different concentrations, it, it induced uh, flowering as well as rooting. And uh, this uh, flowering, uh, flowering cycles is uh, found to be only after eight weeks of treatment. Okay, next one. Since uh, coming to the different carbosols, we uh, tried for inducing the flowering cycle, in, that is sucrose, glucose, fructose, and maltose. We found that sucrose is the best one for inducing the flowering, and uh, this which is followed by glucose. And, uh, and fructose and maltose has no more role in the, and uh, lactose and maltose has no role in the flower induction. And uh, the fructose also a bit of uh, uh, effect on this flower induction. Okay, next. And for floral bud in uh, formation, uh, we tried different concentration of sucrose, and it is found that the, the optimum concentration of five percentage uh, or induced flowering within forty-five days of inoculation, and a higher concentration of uh, sucrose that is at ten percent totally inhibited flowering as well as it's uh, 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 it's turned the uh, tissue tissue into a uh, brown or red in color, and it's a uh, totally damaged the tissue. Okay. Next. These are the photographs of the uh, uh, flowers induced in different treatment and uh, different species. And the first uh, picture shows about the shoot cultures of the endocrams, don't just pathos and radius, and second one is the spike rate that we obtained from Babosa Barkova. And uh, the, la uh, the last one is the uh, peg induced flowering in uh, Newtons, whereas uh, the photo period induced flowering and as well as the um, uh, stress induced, that is one by eight thousand dilution of uh, flowering in the Tulda species is found in the second last ones. Okay, next. And by concluding that, we found that there is a for. Uh, we can uh, activate the recal. We can remove the recal stern nature of this bamboo by using some uh, novel uh, PGR-like metatopoly. And uh, here we adopt the strategies for preservative chemicals using uh, preservative chemicals that result in the reduction the for and uh, uh, contamination from the endophytic population through the biostatic way. And it also improves the growth and regeneration and hardening of the regenerative plantlets. And uh, this, uh, and uh, through the activation of the plant defense mechanisms through the LCTS, also permit, permit the control of uh, endophytes as well as exogenous contamination. This is permitting the use of pre sprouted nodal expansion as the means of overcoming the dormancy. The control of in vitro flowering in cultures can be achieved by regulating the culture factors that induce stress like shorter culture period, shorter uh, photo period, and lower cytokine level. Okay, next. Okay, thank you. Thank you. This is all about my presentation. Thank you, Dr. Vidya. That was a very informative, technically driven presentation. Wonderful. Ladies and gentlemen, the floor is open for questions. Any questions from the audience? Yes, Pratik, please go ahead. Uh, good morning, ma'am. Uh, I wanted to ask, like, uh, how close are we to predict uh, gregarious or sporadic flowering uh, in real real life? Like, these are the experimentation 
done in the labs but uh, how close are we to you know predicting it in uh, real time yeah actually actually we developed the system for predicting that that one also uh, we are we are inducing this in bit of flowering system and we have have to done some biochemical as well as more level of test especially we mainly focused on the biochemical test and we identify what are the parameters such as the, uh, within the plant material what are the parameters enhanced or changed like uh, sucrose level any any particular changes in the uh, uh, cell wall or uh, they are uh, any accumulation of any particular hormone such kind of things we have to identify and then comparing that with the uh, plant material that we are grow uh, we are uh, suspecting that we, that is going to flower <clears throat> and comparing those parameters we can identify this species is going to flower in the field and uh, that way we can control uh, if you are we are uh, identify that species is going to flower we can harvest that as much as, as much as possible as much as possible right. so we can avoid the uh, loss through this flowering for the farmers right right and uh, okay yeah thank you yeah thank you prati uh, mr sohar please yes yeah can i go with my question please please hi uh, hello ma'am i just have one small question am i audible ma'am yeah hold the question yeah uh, basically what in western ghats the bamboo we are having here uh, people say it is 45 years for something like uh, bhima and some a few species are there still not yet got flooded so how can we differentiate all these things because which is the best suitable thing for edible we cannot determine unless it is being tested in lab because farmers are facing something like that so if possible can you make anything like that to for which industry whichever it is good uh, for edible purpose and kfr itself they are doing some experiments on that and uh, and we have done a lot of some experiments with the different bamboo species like uh, uh, and uh, we found that uh, most of the species we tried that is bamboo sabalcova delta kama gigantus brand c uh, this uh, melocana stoxi richi uh, even uh, this oclandra also and even the, our bamboo sa uh, uh, very very just try it also we try and uh, the we found that most of the species are edible and the only thing is that we just uh, I, i think you may know their treatment before uh, we are using for edible purpose uh, we have to just boil and remove the water content to reduce the cyanide content so from uh, different literature as well as my uh, experience, experience it's found that most of the bamboo species are edible and uh, we just have to identify the suitable time for collecting the plant material that's uh, edible shoot and uh, never go for the, uh, the we can we can see some of the shoots which is uh, just uh, seem as the stemmers but it is in some in uh, that is in a dormant stage in winter season or something like that just uh, for our western cut people we just go for the shoot that emerge just after for first training in the monsoon okay. most of the species are edible and from yeah possibly uh, the pardon the naturally grown bamboos are most uh, ideal for people because Uh, if we grow through this any any side effects is going to happen because it is a very new thing now what's happening in this industry for the first time so just a question because Thank using you. the bi- biotech saplings and planting and raising the shoots uh, will that make anything wrong for the edible uh, yeah actually for uh, the most of the people prefer this dendroclama sasper for the edible purpose in a commercial level uh, just uh, just keeping uh, uh, philostachys edulis philostachys edulis is the uh, widely used species for throughout the world uh, for edible purpose but the second one is the dendroclama sasper but from our experiments bambusa bambus also you, you, you suitable for this uh, uh, that is the most common species that found in our in our area strictus also very uh, ideal uh, plant for this <clears throat> edible purpose but in the case of uh, strictus it has a bit of Uh, uh, bitter test. It's a slightly bitter when comparing to the other species. That's all. Yeah, but it is also good for the eating purpose. 
I have not tasted yet. So by the works of all we people, hope we can taste it in future days into the culinary yeah, section. Yeah, we already done country. all those. You can Thank don't you. worry about that. No fear about that. You can you can go ahead. But the only thing is remaining. Uh, remain yeah. is that. Just boil the thing for uh, gray, just before using that as the uh, for the cooking purpose. Boil and drain the water. So, That's it. Okay. okay. Thank you. Just like to add, there is a presentation already in our BSI YouTube library on bamboo shoot production. So you can refer that for complete details. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions from the audience? Dr. Bharti, sir, would you like to add anything? Thank you for the opportunity. And uh, this is a wonderful uh, lecture by Vidya. I think I know how long you have been working in uh, tissue culture. You have really, really narrated a very long information about the contamination possibility to reduce through various uh, technology techniques, which is adapted for in other, other, other species, not in bamboo. And also the flowering, how it's happening, what is getting induced, very detailed studies you have done. Very good, very good. I'm very happy, very happy to listen to you and uh, good, wonderful work. Vidya, how long have you been working in uh, this kind of aspects? Uh, sir, actually, I have worked Dr. with Dr. Murali. Yeah, sir. Uh, actually, I have worked with Dr. Murali Dharan in Kerala Forest Research Institute. I am his uh, uh, PhD student. I, uh, this, is one, uh, this is a part of my PhD work. Uh, I have worked, uh, my work started with the KFRA by 2011. Uh, and, uh, okay, very detailed work. I think... Uh, Credit should go equally to you and Dr. Murli. And <laughs> I know such a detailed work. Very good, very good. And uh, there is other gentleman who was talking about, Patel was asking quite a few things on the shoots. And he had a little doubt, I think, uh, on the tissue culture plant, whether it is edible or not. You know, because we are using so many chemicals and so many things inside. inside. And uh, um, Mr. Patel is yeah. here. May I answer? Yeah. Yes, sir. What, what the was asked. Yeah, actually, and, uh, uh, we, I we thought I'll this. tell him. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, we use this chemicals only for tissue culture conditions. And just after hardening, after hardening, this, uh, this, uh, the initial material that we are uh, that exposed to these chemicals are uh, just removed from the uh, newly grown shoots. And uh, our, uh, you are all a uh, tissue culture man, you know how long our actual sapling is surviving in the field. And just uh, within the uh, three to four years, our original sapling is removed by the newly grown shoots and it ha they have the capacity to absorb the nutrients from the soil. So there is no worries about such kind of uh, different kinds of chemicals that we are using in the tissue culture. I, I think you know very well. And you're just... I know, I know, I know. But the, that gentleman asked for that. And he had a doubt whether we can eat the shoot of tissue culture plant. Yeah. You know, yeah, I think because... Patel, I'll also add, I'll also add, today, you see, ba banana is grown. I started banana in 1986. And from then onwards, people have been doing tissue culture of banana, and they are growing it, and they are using it, even in organic farming. You know, not the normal farming. In organic farming also, they are not able to trace any of these tissue culture chemical what is used. In fact, it is recommended that they should tissue culture plant because they don't carry any diseases from the previous generation to the next generation. So less chemical can be used, number one. Number two, this there is no effect of this. This is fully, and especially in the last stage, most they use charcoal activated charcoal to remove, absorb all these chemicals. And the plants come out is completely free. Number one, number two, the few grams, the plants are one or two grams. And the plant, when they grow, it is close to around 250 kilograms to 500 kilograms each plant. 
And this effect totally get vanished in that, even if it is there. It is also removed, totally removed. It's not a problem at all. And uh, the previous gentleman was talking about uh, uh, Pratik, no? He was talking about the flowering. Yes. Sir. And this information, what Vidya said is, you know, if somebody is looking at it, there are two types of flowering, as he said. One is sporadic flowering, and then there is gregarious flowering. Gregarious goes by the genetic character of the plant, and then no, nobody can really manipulate that. But what can be manipulated or controlled is sporadic flowering. They keep flowering. Here and there, it will keep flowering. It happens. And she has given an excellent explanation. Number one, she said about the effect of sunlight. The wave, you know, the day length is going to increase. More the wave, more light, the flowering is going to be induced. The second, she also very well said, the nutrient deficiency in the plant. When you keep growing the plant, the same test tube or bottle, for more than that, the flower, chances of flower getting induced is there. And the same thing happens in the soil. A lot of people also in the field that the flowering in any plant is due to non-availability of water, nutrient to the soil, and the hot weather, and the dry weather which is passing through the plant. They've induced the flowering, but the flower may not be seen the same day. It will be seen only after six months. They, the, the, the problem happens in the summer. They are able to see the flower after uh, something like you know six months. The flower comes over, the shoots are there. Then only they realize the plant has produced a flower. So, in order to avoid this, nutrient application is very essential. In a good fertile land, the, this will never happen. And that we very well, Dr. Vidya explained with our experiment, that the same plant kept in a test tube for four weeks, eight weeks, so even beyond that 16 weeks, the, the chance is increasing. And depending on the species also, they keep changing. All these are the, you know, the very good information one should follow while cultivating the bamboo especially when you're growing to grow them, you know, in an intensive way, you need to really feed them well because it's one of the fastest eating plant and fastest growing plant. So that way, I think yeah, your experiments are all very, very relevant to what's happening in the field today. And one can really look at it. The gentleman was asking you about the flowering when we find out, but I think, I think Dr. Murli also is here somewhere, right? Yeah, Murli then is there. Yes, uh, I have added him right now. Yes, ask him also to welcome, talk welcome. about the flowering. He has put a lot of years of work in bamboo. You know, there is no system available today to predict the genetic age of the plant through the biochemical method. Maybe it's going to be developed. I do not know whether already Dr. Murali has worked on it, but to the best of my knowledge, by taking one plant, we cannot find out what is the genetic age. Has it spent 10 years earlier or one year earlier or 35 years earlier, next year is going to flower. Only thing is, one year before the flowering, you see the leaves are getting reduced to smaller size. That's only only one year by front, by in front. I've, I've seen in front of my eyes in my campus, one by one, stage by stage, when they go into the flowering, the leaf size reduced. <laughs> then they start producing the bud. Then the flowering came. Then the plant died. Totally. I think Dr. Murli then should be able to, you know, throw some light on the, the question asked by the, by the by, Welcome. Uh, Welcome, Dr. Murli, sir. Would you like to add anything? Probably is busy. Dr. Murlisa, are you there? Okay, probably is busy. Uh, thank you all. Dr. Bharti, sir, thank you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. welcome. Thank you, sir. Any, any sir, questions from the audience? Yes, sir. I wanted to continue on that conversation and ask if these results can be applied. Like, uh, for example, we were talking about uh, sucrose and applying sucrose directly on the field or maybe the lighting conditions like red light generally promotes uh, plant growth. So can these be applied on, you know, real-time field and uh, uh, could, this, could this thing work? Uh, never go for the application of this sucrose and other things directly. We just maintain the we just maintain the balance of the older nutrients like other plants. Okay. Uh, so never go for the uh, never go never try to induce some stress on the plants as Dr. Bharati said. And uh, we just avoid the stress condition in aspects of this nutrients as well as the water conditions as well. Uh, there is no chance for this uh, like like 
conditions. That is, we have we are all getting the uh, safe water period. But this nutrient depletion, as far as the water stress that we can manage. So just uh, just avoid to such kind of conditions and maintain the minority. Uh, Thank can you. I, uh, can can I? Uh, I think Dr. Morelli is there. And yeah, I, I had some technical problems and and uh, yes. I couldn't. Uh, Welcome, sir. Uh, what was the question addressed to me, <coughs> Dr. Bharti? Uh, it was about the flowering. Yeah, can the yeah. covering be identified? The genetic case of the plant can it oh, be yeah, identified? Yeah, yeah. Just as just as uh, Dr. Vitya mentioned. We are a bit away from uh, that stage where we can really predict uh, because we are just trying to understand the different parameters that uh, eventually result in stress, if that is one factor. We are actually looking at gregarious flowering, which, has a, which is a much more complex phenomenon uh, and uh, genetically controlled, uh, uh, we should presume. And uh, predicting it a few years uh, ahead of uh, the actual event uh, would have two, two ways of doing it. One, if uh, the species is uh, a well-known species, uh, well documented, then you can uh, actually zero down to the actual flowering cycle, which uh, present um, uh, um, information we do not know for even the most important species also. Uh, take bamboos or bamboos, which we have uh, around the country. If you look at the um, flowering records, they are not uh, precise to the year. Uh, many overlapping populations are there, uh, which might uh, confuse our uh, data. So the one way of doing it is to be uh, precise about the uh, year of flowering. Uh, usually the flowering occurs in a, a period of one to three years and uh, make a record of that. For the same population, you expect a flowering in a precise, uh, that's what we can presume. But uh, short of that, uh, we have to look at biochemical and uh, most promisingly molecular uh, signals, uh, which uh, uh, at right now we do not have, no. But uh, studies such as what has been done by Dr. Vidya would lead to that, uh, maybe even biochemical. Uh, uh, what happens, what results in the stress, uh, which uh, results in flowering. Some of the molecular studies in China indicated uh, the link uh, with uh, drought-induced genes, some genes that uh, um, uh, lying the same pathway as uh, when drought is induced. So we, we, uh, we are still a bit away from uh, the kind of uh, information we have to predict uh, bamboo flowering, which would, of course, be very useful for uh, you know, um, uh, uh, having, uh, I mean, uh, the plantation or the forest, we can harvest a, a significant amount of the biomass before it uh, uh, flowers. And flowering, you know, sometimes results in a lot of uh, dead wood, which is a fire hazard also. Uh, so th that's my response to the question. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your valuable inputs. Mr. So, Patrick asked something more, no? He was asking about, can we uh, apply sucrose and then light and red light applied? Yes, sir. Generally, like, uh, generally we do that in hydroponics or vertical farming. So system like that, you know, just to uh, induce more growth in even sapling stage or, you know, like that. Yeah, in a general manner, uh, what you say might be feasible, but I can't imagine a situation where uh, huge plantations are uh, sprayed with chemicals. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. Would rather, I would rather depend on uh, predicting the flowering and uh, sticking to precise uh, uh, harvesting and management schedules and all use uh, species which are uh, um, inherently sterile and there's no risk of uh, gregarious flowering. The in vitro flowering uh, phenomenon is something restricted to uh, uh, tissue cultures, where, uh, as you all can uh, imagine, uh, stress can come in different ways, like what uh, Dr. Vidya has mentioned. But uh, in plantations per se, uh, we need a, a, a different method, either predicting it a few right, years sir. back, not by not by uh, interventions such as what you suggested. So cross spraying may not uh, uh, give the intended results because in vitro conditions are quite different from what are uh, what you find in uh, the field. 
right sir and like what about infrared technologies like there were research about using infrared to you know uh, even for treated bamboo poles uh, they had that they can uh, predict the molecular structure or something like that using that uh, are there any research done uh, i think i think you are uh, probably confusing between infrared and far red uh, part of the spectrum infrared I'm sorry, would it be, was yeah, ir yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, ir for treatment may, may be feasible because it produces heat Right. But IR right. Uh, for the physiology of plants, uh, I don't think uh, has any. If you're talking about um, uh, the photo period and the quality of the light, then uh, the far red part of the spectrum and uh, other parts of the spectrum might be um, more, uh, uh, you know, relevant. Right. Uh, yeah. Okay, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That was some conversations. Yeah. One moment. I just. Yeah, one, yes, one, one addition, instead of giving sucrose, like what is done in uh, tissue culture, we have done work on these kind of a product flowering on the bamboo plant in the plantation. Um, you know, a couple of things we tried, we've been trying for the last 10 years, and we, we also keep seeing the flowering continues. I have a plant here which grows for, grown for 15 years. Out of the 10 years, it's keep flowering. But still, uh, you know, it's one of the bulk of our species studied. You know, what we observed is, the moment you are able to substitute with nitrogen fertilizer to the plant, the flowering suppresses. But <clears throat> while doing that, this is for the sporadic flowering, not for the gregarious flowering. In the sporadic flowering, there are here and there the plant will flower. Immediately, we should identify narrowing the leaf on the first bud emergence. Then uh, we need to really increase the local nutrient available by way of applying good quantity of organic manure and NPK. Mostly the nitrogen influences a lot. And right. immediately those branches which is flowered should be cut and removed. Mm -hmm. Because we found when you leave it, they like a disease, they keep spreading. There's a, some amount of endogenic hormones are secreted in the stressed uh, portion of the bamboo plant. Uh, then they, they slowly get transmitted to other things. Even the new bamboo shoot coming will grow and it will flower. If this is not there, they don't flower. We have recovered many such plants from the flowering to non-flowering stage in Balkova. We have done many, many work on this on the, with, my, with our farmers and fields and all that. The, that happens because in a field, the entire field may not be very uniform for the nutrient availability. Or right, stress. Sir. stress, especially when in the border, the hot air which is blowing, which creates a stress. And that stress makes the demand for water more. When the, whenever the bam, plam, bamboo is going through a stress, they try to flower and finish their life. But so this plant, like you know, the balco in which we are working in Big Bay, is a sterile because of which they don't die. The moment if we can recover them, return them, return it back to the vegetative growth, it goes away. But uh, as Dr. Morley said, applying red light in a big way is very difficult. But in the greenhouse, it's just, it does a good job. We right. have tried, even in the go through my pride, not now, long, long, many years back, uh, we use the LED bulbs for that. And there are spectrum specific LED bulbs available. And they are able to give more light or more, uh, more quantum of uh, photosynthetically active light than our tube lights. So, you know, we, we did yeah. a lot of work with this. And, uh, you know, that's a better chance if you want to convert energy into, instead of tungsten lamp or into a tube light, better to go for LED with mm -hmm. spectrum specific blue as well as red. The okay. green is totally useless for the plant. They yes, just sir. throw away the green. But just many the, of our greenhouses, you can see them today, they all look green. Yeah, yeah, just the, you know, rules that we apply in vertical farming uh, to indoor, just at least the things that we do indoor, those yeah. can be at least applied to, you know, enhance the productivity, I guess. And even... Yeah, possible uh, for the greenhouse, not for the field as Dr. Morley said. Definitely, definitely. Footprint is a big uh, problem, uh, I think. And also, uh, applying the cost goes up dramatically if you increase uh, for field. There are people who have tried, uh, uh, yeah. you know, especially Osram. Osram has done a lot of work in this area. But practically, for a large plantation, it is a bit difficult. But vertical farming, yes, per se, that's, that's a good way to do things. Right. right. I think the uh, take-home message from what uh, Dr. Bharti mentioned is that uh, when you have uh, uh, high input uh, management with uh, uh, irrigation fertilizers, the incidence of uh, flowering or at least the danger of uh, flowering occurring to an extent that the plantations are affected is reduced considerably. This is the example of most cultivated bamboos. Uh, you know, the other bamboos which are brought into a new situation where stresses are there, 
notably um, you know uh, water stress i mean uh, uh, low in water and uh, high in uh, let's say heat and uh, the the kind of uh, dust storm i mean the heat storms that you have in many parts of india mm. this will induce surfacing but no, when you have a, a a plantation a healthy plantation managed properly with high inputs the incidence is considerably reduced at least that is my uh, uh, experience with what i've seen in around the world um, you take the example of uh, moso and things like that flowering was never a, never an issue um you in the forests uh, you might find uh, flowering but not in the plantations because they are well managed so i think there's something in that uh, for the present until we have a better means of identifying or predicting flowering that is my view yes doctor yes doctor see there is no flowering at all in uh, moso it uh, <laughs> it's for so many years you're right because the cultivation Well, I think we have some signal problem. Dr. Bharti, are you there? No, I'm there. I'm there. Okay, wonderful. If there is, there is, if there is anything else, we'll discuss or yeah, you can. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for joining this webinar. It's been wonderful. Uh, Dr. Vidya, I'd like to thank on uh, behalf of uh, entire BSI. Uh, thank you for your time. It's a very very enlightening uh, session and. Um, Dr. Murli Dharan, Dr. Bharti sir, and rest of the audience, I would like to also thank you for joining us and sharing your valuable time. With this, uh, we come to the end of today's webinar. Thank you very much. Please follow us on uh, YouTube. Please follow us on uh, Telegram, and also uh, follow us on the on our website. With this, we come to the conclusion of today's webinar. Thank you. Everyone, you. have a wonderful weekend. Thank you.